Dr. Vasilev, thank you very much for this interview. This is such an honor to be sitting with you and discuss the questions that our patients had about endometriosis with you. And thank you for your time. Can Absolutely. You, sure. Can you please tell a little bit about you and, and what's your experience and what's your practice about? I would love to hear, and I'm sure patients would love to hear about that. Sure, I'm glad to be here. I am a gynecologic oncologist who does a lot of robotic surgery and of an integrative mindset. So I come from a little bit different space from most and happen to be interested in endometriosis as well as uh, some of the cancer surgery I've done over the years. Um, basically, I've been doing endo excision surgery actually for decades, um, initially by laparoscopy, now by robotic surgery. And as, as mentioned, my bent is not just the surgery, but also the uh, integrative management. And I tend to focus on women who are uh, perhaps a little bit older um, in 30s and 40s, and even into menopause where the, there's actually some overlap with uh, pelvic masses that could be endometriomas and, or something else and things like that. Thank you, that was great. Um, can I ask you one follow-up question? And what made you interested in endometriosis? Because you know, you have, you are a gynecologic oncologist and I mean, you had other opportunities and other uh, areas that you could help patients, but instead you decided that you want to focus a lot on endometriosis. What was, what was the rationale or what was the motivation for that decision? I would love to hear about that. So let me give you some background first. So this makes sense. Gynecologic oncologists are pretty much at the pinnacle of gynecologic training for complex abdominal and pelvic surgery and are trained to operate on any organ in the abdomen and pelvis, uh, just like a general surgeon and gynecologist and urologist combined, really. This is usually a three or four year fellowship, so there's quite a bit of training beyond residency. Beyond that, although cancer is the specialty focus, we're very often asked to do the most difficult benign gynecologic cases with multiple anatomic uh, distortions, multiple prior surgeries, and this often includes endometriosis. The problem is that many gynocs are not focused on minimally invasive where it counts relative to endo, and most do not study endo, so they don't understand it. I've actually been doing endo excision for decades, but you're right, my main focus had been cancer. Here's what happened. Based on increasing endo referrals, what I saw, particularly over the last five to 10 years, really frustrated me. I saw too many women who were suffering with no diagnosis, which turned out to be endo when I operated, or had the wrong diagnosis, or already had been through multiple non-expert endo-related excision surgeries, and still in pain. Uh, it became clear to me that expertise in endo-excision, endo-management is out there, but it's apparently hard to find. Beyond that, there was kind of a perfect storm of what I was already doing in the cancer world, which I'll touch on in a second. That got me to a point where I could help more women with endo. First, the main killer in gynecology is ovarian cancer. Surgical removal of all visible disease, wherever it is in the pelvis, on the bladder, on the diaphragm, and so on, is critical. It's really, life literally depends on getting all the visible disease out before medical therapy but most of my colleagues still do this through a very large incision. Since I was a minimally invasive surgeon for over 20 years at the time already, I thought there has to be a better way. So now I'm among a handful of surgeons internationally that do ovarian cancer surgery robotically. Endo, even if it's not a killer, can spread and behave very much like ovarian cancer. So the goal of endo excision surgery is very similar to remove all visible disease. Second, my research interest in uh, molecular biology overlap between oncology and endometriosis. So for example, in our translational research lab right now, we're looking at ways to diagnose and monitor endo through microRNA signatures. Basically studying what makes endo tick on a molecular genomic and epigenetic level really gave me a deeper understanding of the disease. Third, I'm also board certified in integrative and holistic medicine which opens up a lot of treatment options using nutrition and lifestyle modification. Again, this overlaps what I've already been doing on the cancer side for a long time. I actually have a few books out on that topic of uh, holistic approaches to the treatment and endo's disease where a lot of these same principles apply and they overlap the molecular biology as well. Basically, 
we can find out how nutrients affect genes and switch them on and off. So overall, those that seek me out for help tend to be older women from 30s through 40s and into menopause where maybe multiple surgeries have already been done or the endo is more advanced as in the case of true postmenopausal endo. Um, sometimes there's pain and findings that fit endometriosis and adenomyosis, but no one's considering it because it's not supposed to happen after menopause. So also you get closer to and into menopause, the endo associated risk for ovarian cancer increases, which again is part of what I do. So if there's a family history, genetic testing is part of our uh, diagnostic plan. And we're prepared for that unusual but possible scenario during surgery in older women. So I think my minimally invasive robotic surgical and integrative skill base and research interests just happen to fit very well with helping women get to a better place and the best chance at beating endo, even with advanced or uh, recurrent disease. It just kind of simply came together where I could simply do the most good for the most people. And that's my story with that. Um, all right, so thank you so much. That's great. Uh, I can understand that's a great uh, decision. That's a big decision for you, for a professional to dedicate his life to a specific group of patients who are not necessarily served very well by our medical system. And they definitely need your expertise and, and you are vetted by other peers in a double blind review process, which tells us about your expertise and how we can handle these cases. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions that we have learned that our community has that question for experts. And these questions are specifically tailored to you based on what patients know about you. And the first question is, after a total excision, which I assume it means like full excision by an expert, do we still have endometriosis in that patient? Is there any chance that this can happen? So the answer to that question is uh, multifaceted uh, as well as some of the other things we're talking about. But this is where I bring my um, expertise in the ovarian cancer side in as well, because that has been studied a little bit more uh, than in the endometriosis side. So the reason I'm mentioning that backdrop is that when you remove everything, um, in fact, cancer surgeons are famous for saying, we got it all. The reality is that microscopically, there are some disease usually left behind. <clears throat> so when you, can re when you remove everything visible, uh, which is total excision, there can be microscopic uh, foci of endometriosis, just like there is in cancer left behind. Now, <clears throat> that may or may not mean very much clinically to someone, meaning how they do, because uh, again, in the uh, world of endometriosis regrowth, if you will, uh, when you go from potentially microscopic disease that may be there after a complete excision, and again, you're correct in pointing out that this does depend on expert excision. If you have somebody that kind of hunts and pecks and takes out some lesions that they kind of sort of see, but don't really look for the other lesions that may be hiding using some specialized techniques, um, <clears throat> then it may not be a total excision after all. But assuming that there is an expert uh, excision along those lines, the, the risk is the uh, microscopic disease that may be left behind. And that is uh, when people look at recurrence rates for endometriosis, uh, it, it's a little bit um, uh, incomplete information because most of the published research is on ultrasound findings. Is there an endometrioma that's growing back? Or in pain, is there increasing pain again? It's usually not a repeat surgery. It can be, and there are some papers along those lines, but um, most of the time, it's, it's not um, that gold standard of actually operating on someone again. It does happen, like I said, um, but unfortunately, we really don't know um, exactly how much may be left behind because that second surgery may happen a long, long time after the first one. Right, so you basically, so you, this is what you say, like even if an expert goes in and does surgery, there is a slight chance that there are some microscopic lesions 
there or in, in ovaries which can turn into endometrioma or in other places that then later can grow or whatever there is very like there is a slight chance of that uh, but also if you don't go to an expert for total excision this can be not just the microscopic lesions it could be bigger lesions right uh, i would like you to uh, to tell us like is there any way that an expert can find a microscopic lesion when they are doing some surgery? Has there been any technology that help you or there, is there any gold standard for you to figure that out? So finding smaller lesions, where they be, whether they be microscopic or just um, not immediately obvious to the average surgeon who doesn't do a lot of endometriosis or even to some folks who are endo excision surgeons that just have not explored some of the extra technologies available, uh, there are uh, those technologies. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned uh, in some of the other questions we're discussing, uh, I am a big fan of robotic surgery because the robotic camera is three-dimensional and can magnify multiple times. So a laparoscopic surgeon can bring a camera very close to a lesion, and that's one way to find smaller lesions is by examining surfaces of peritoneum much more closely than just looking from a distance, so to speak. So you have to get really, really close, and then you begin to identify areas that are abnormal. With robotics, that's increased even more because when you're dealing with uh, magnification, that's one. The other, with the three-dimensional uh, view. And there are some laparoscopic um, approaches that, or, or platforms that give you this 3D thing where it's kind of like going to a movie theater and wearing red and green glasses. It's kind of not exactly 3D, but you see it as 3D. With robotics, it's real 3D. You're using both eyeballs and you can see um, very, very slight imperfections that you cannot see laparoscopically. So um, while I think laparoscopy is acceptable for many cases, to me, having done that for many, many years, robotics is just much better on that front. So you can actually see the uh, smaller lesions, uh, better technology. Um, the other is that there are special dyes that can be used, for example. There's uh, something called endocyanin green or ICG. Uh, that has been published on a fair amount and I personally use it uh, a lot actually because what happens is that it accentuates uh, abnormalities when you use a special uh, camera light uh, called near infrared. So that allows us, again, these are, these are technologies that just take it to the next level uh, so that we're able to see um, lesions that uh, may be hiding uh, otherwise. Thank you very much. That, that was great, great explanation. And I absolutely learned something from you. Um, talking about surgery and techniques and using robotics versus laparoscopy, let's, let's say someone decides, a patient decides that this is the time for her to go to do a surgery for endometriosis, right? Can this surgery, which we are, we are assuming it's an excision surgery done by an expert, can this surgery make endometriosis worse or make it spread? If you, if you could answer this question in two scenarios, the first scenario is, this is a top expert doing the surgery. Second scenario, this is a random surgeon who doesn't have training or doesn't have expertise and experience in endometriosis doing the surgery. What happens in this situation? Can it make it worse or make it spread? So to answer the question uh, about uh, whether uh, surgery can make things worse and if the surgical expertise is uh, contributes to that? The answer is definitely yes, actually on both fronts potentially, but there's a lot of uh, qualifying uh, statements to that that I kind of need to make to explain myself. First of all, in terms of what surgeon does, it may dictate what they exactly do, whether they're really excising or whether they're kind of burning some things and excising other things. Uh, that is not really a complete excision, and with that you can actually uh, damage the tissue and cause more scarring and maybe not make the endometriosis grow more, but you can create more problems, more symptoms uh, to where after surgery, there's really no benefit. And down the line, it can have an increased risk of uh, growing back. 
Um, but along those lines also, um, first of all, this can happen to any surgeon, but complications do occur. So it's not just that is, a, is the surgery gonna make the endometriosis worse, is are you gonna be worse? And that is a very big question because everybody thinks of laparoscopy and robotics as being minimally invasive. So, you know, it's safe surgery. Yes, it is, and certainly better with expert hands. But even in the very best surgeon's hands, there are risks of complications. When you don't have the very best surgeon, or again, this can happen in anybody's, it's just gonna be lower risk in someone um, that is uh, an expert. But there are structures that are nearby that are easily gonna be potentially damaged like the ureters, which connect your kidneys and your bladder or your rectum or bowel. Um, and especially if you're doing fulguration instead of, or burning instead of uh, excis excising the tissue, uh, there is a risk of damaging those structures. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't just mean, oops, I damaged something. It's okay, it's probably gonna get better a little longer to heal. No, in the worst case scenario, something leaks like your bowel or urine from your ureter or your bladder. That can lead to multiple surgeries to fix that situation. And in the case of a bowel leak, it actually can, can cause death because of overwhelming infection. So I just wanna make that clear that you're going to an expert surgeon, not just to excise it and hopefully get a better outcome and uh, not have endo spread. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, because of the better technique versus uh, not, but also this risk of complications, which is uh, a huge issue. So either the surgeon has to be an expert, well, that, that's a given uh, for starters, but either that surgeon needs to be able to fix what they potentially see, uh, potentially was injured, uh, or uh, better, uh, avoid those injuries in the first place as best as possible, or have a team there that is able to help uh, fix uh, the damage that's potentially a cause to the bowel or ureters. So that part addresses the complications. But the other question is, can surgery actually uh, lead to a spread of endometriosis? And this is not something that is talked about a lot, but there are a couple of things here that are important to think about. And the data is somewhat limited on this, but it's, um, it's provocative. It's interesting to look at this and say, boy, are we doing something right or is there some improvement possible here? So when you have endometriosis implants, whether they be in the peritoneum or whether they're in the ovary causing an endometrioma, that means these are cells that are already implanted, already growing whether you think that the endo was there because of retrograde menstruation, the old Samson theory, or uh, is it immunologic or hormonal based? For whatever reason, it doesn't really matter for what I'm about to say. Uh, it means it's growing, something's there and it's causing a problem. So uh, when you address an endometrioma, um, which is the quote unquote chocolate cyst, and that endometrioma is not just blood filled, there's something that caused that, and that's the endometriosis growing on, on and in the ovary. When that tissue, or that fluid rather, is drained, it's not just old blood, it is actually uh, endometriosis cells that are there as well. We know that uh, older studies where they kind of approached it in a very minimally invasive way to where the endometrioma was just drained through the skin with a needle, that the endometriomas grew back a lot faster. Why? It's because those endometriosis cells are still there, still growing, still producing uh, the uh, blood and so forth. So if you rupture an endometrioma during surgery uh, and there's a lot of chocolate fluid that comes out. Yes, most of that is just old blood, but there's also tissue coming out that's endometriosis type that is already proven that it can implant and grow. Uh, so there is reason for concern that just like endometriomas recur when you just drain them and don't remove them, that if that tissue, that fluid and tissue cells are allowed to just spill into the pelvis and no big deal, which unfortunately a lot of surgeons do look at it that way, uh, that could be a big mistake because those uh, cells can grow. You can irrigate, you could try to um, clean out uh, what you spilled, but it's not necessarily gonna remove the microscopic stuff left behind. So having said that, 
It is easy to rupture an endometrioma during surgery, even in expert hands. How can you avoid it or should you avoid it? Well, for the reasons I just mentioned, you probably should think about avoiding it. It would be better technique if you just tried to take out the endometrioma in one piece or try to drain it in such a way that it doesn't spill into the pelvis kind of freely, right? So that's one thing you can do. And how do you do that? Well, again, with robotic surgery, which I'm a big fan of, you have better optics, better um, instruments that are very meticulous in being able to uh, remove an endometrioma intact, or at least control drain inside a a containment bag where if it spills, it doesn't spill into the pelvis. These are considerations that an expert surgeon is thinking about. And surgeons that are not so expert are saying, well, it's just an endometrioma, it exploded, no big deal, it will clean it up. You could be causing harm there for microscopically very viable um, reasons that I basically just described, that these cells can grow and implant into the peritoneum. So in that regard, uh, it does uh, depend on how you approach uh, some of these uh, tissues. And if you excise it in the, with the best possible technique and avoid spill of an endometrioma, if at all possible, or control it, then you are less likely to cause, or far less likely to cause any kind of um, worsening of the disease. But if you don't pay attention to these things, then yes, a, a kind of a non-expert surgery could lead to uh, a worsening over the years of a recurrent situation, uh, both of the endometrioma and of endometriosis growing in the pelvis. Right, so thank you very much. Um, so here's my understanding that this like, like if someone asks, will surgery make endo worse or make it spread? The, the best answer is depends on who did the surgery? And also it depends on many other factors during the surgery. Like even the top expert, if they don't be careful enough, they can also make some mistakes that lead to spread of endometrioma. As you said, in endometrioma situation, can, le can leak and then spread some cells around. That's a, that's a really important thing to, to consider all the time by experts and by patients. That's important. So following, this question so let's say someone goes to an expert a good expert and does a full treatment which includes an excision of endometriosis and that expert has a great team after that surgery do you still think that patient needs to be suppressed by hormones what's the what's the situation what are the situations that you would recommend it what are the situations that you wouldn't recommend it and what's your philosophy for that so if a excision is complete to the best uh, ability to tell grossly, in other words, maybe there's microscopic something left behind, but you've removed everything you can see, including tiny lesions that you're using better technologies to identify, uh, like again, uh, different uh, staining uh, dye techniques and robotics, better visualization. You've done all that and you're as complete as possible. Um, I would say that there, the data, unfortunately, that's published is not published with complete excision in mind. So if you look up the literature, the medical scientific literature, whether it's worth doing something like this, you'll find a couple things. Number one is that everybody would agree that suppression after something like this, when the next step is pregnancy, uh, doesn't make very much sense. So that kind of rules that plan out completely. If someone is not planning on pregnancy, then there are a lot of papers. There's something called the Cochrane Collaboration, which has reviewed uh, all of these papers that are published and kind of summarize them, um, as well as other uh, summaries of the data. And it says, uh, bottom line, is that sometimes the suppression does make sense with oral contraception or other agents. And they've looked at pretty much all of them, including Danazol and GnRH and uh, contraceptives, as I mentioned, et cetera. The problem is that the surgical uh, input into that, those patients that were put into those studies, uh, were usually a combined um, group of people that may have had stage three to four disease, may have had stage one to two disease, may have had complete excisions, or maybe they had a combination of fulgurations and excisions. So it becomes a mixed bag of patients going into those studies. 
So it's very difficult to draw a conclusion as to whether this is of benefit to those patients who have had a real bona fide complete excision. You can argue about this on a scientific basis all day long, uh, but from the standpoint of clinical outcomes, there, uh, the smaller series that are published that, that uh, or just from discussing with colleagues, the more you have really excised everything, the more it doesn't make too much sense to do these kind of suppressions because they are going to lead to potentially some side effects depending on what agents you're using. Uh, and endometriosis is not like cancer. It doesn't grow back like wildfire. So even though you can make the argument that let's just say uh, we had a paper that actually proved that it works, what does that mean? Well, maybe it reduced the risk of having this grow back in 10 years, maybe it changed it to nine years or something like that. Meanwhile, though, you've had all these side effects from the medication. So it's a very loaded question without an answer because the, the data that is being fed into these studies, uh, again, the type of surgery that was done is, is not clean. Um, so uh, we, uh, we really, honestly, the answer is we don't really know, except the caveats that I just mentioned that the more you have a complete excision, the more you have microscopic maybe disease that's left behind, the less it makes sense to do any kind of suppressive therapy. Right, it, it really amazed me the way that you looked at it, like reducing like suppression can elongate symptom-free and post-op duration, for example, from nine to 10 years. But on the, on the flip side, you are dealing with a lot of complications of the suppression. So it's a cost and benefit situation, basically. And it could be a double-edged sword, which you have to consider which, like, which complication do you want to deal with more or which complication is more manageable in long term if you, if you are dealing with a situation like a post-op, some symptoms or, or no symptoms, but the still doctor offer, offers uh, some suppression. That's, that's amazing to me. All right, um, so with that question, I want to ask a couple of questions about endometriosis in people who are a bit older than what most people think endometriosis happen. So in this in this society or even in medical community and in patients community, most people would think endometriosis is a disease of like 20s or 30s mostly, and it goes away miraculously after that. But we know that's not right. And there have been a lot of studies. One of, one of our patients in our community has asked this exact question. How common is it to have endometriosis postmenopausal, like in a person who is postmenopause? So to answer the question about whether uh, endometriosis can occur after menopause, again, there's a couple of uh, uh, twists here as to how you define that. If you're talking about the statistics, how often do we find endometriosis in postmenopausal women? Of all those that do have endometriosis, only about two to 5% maybe are in the menopausal uh, range, uh, looking at it from that standpoint. But it's also important to look at, well, can it develop brand new in menopause? And that's another subset. Or is it something that carried over from premenopause. So in other words, you know you have endometriosis or you think you have it uh, and it's premenopausal, all the usual factors of hormones are in place and you don't really do anything about it. And then six years later during menopause, um, there's more pain and you go for surgery. You're more, totally menopausal at this point. Uh, and you have endometriosis and it's active. That's a different subset and probably more likely to have somebody in that subset than in endo developing brand new in the menopausal years, but both are possible. So how does that happen? Well, first of all, in the patients who try to kind of wait out uh, endometriosis, it may be a recurrent situation. You already know it, but you don't really wanna go through another surgery early. The longer, and you're gonna hope that it just goes away after menopause. Um, the problem with that strategy is that all those years of regrowth 
lead to other factors and that's more fibrosis, for example. So the fibrosis itself can cause a lot of pain. Um, and the longer you wait, the harder it is to remove the uh, fibrosis, so to speak, uh, which is kind of like concrete basically. But the endo itself can grow anyway in the menopausal years. And the reason is that even though most of us think of estrogen as coming only from the ovaries, that's not true. Uh, after menopause, um, and that is very variable also, the average age is 51 to 52 years of age, but it can be more than that. There are women who go through menopause in the mid 50s or something like that. So that's additional years of uh, estrogen um, helping the endometriosis grow. Endo, by the way, does not always grow only because of estrogen. It can grow independently, uh, but it's definitely a factor. So with the ovaries, uh, let's just say they did stop working at 51. Uh, and then what happens? Well, there's still estrogen in your body. It comes from conversion of other hormones into weaker estrogens, but still estrogens in the fat cells of your body. So the more fat cells potentially that you have, uh, the more of conversion occurs. So that is a source of estrogen. Uh, also, uh, there is reason to believe that you have a fair amount of estrogen being converted into active estrogen from what's called xenoestrogens, which are toxins that, that come into your body and unfortunately are stored in your fat cells and then are slowly released over the years. So that can also be a source of estrogen uh, for endometriosis. In addition to that, the endometriosis cells and the cells around them supporting that tissue can produce estrogen themselves, or there are also some changes that occur in molecular biology as you get older to where there are enzymes that convert some of those weaker estrogens I talked about uh, from the fat cells into the more potent estradiol that, that is what's produced by the ovaries. So in multiple ways, uh, the endometriosis can still be uh, accentuated or fed by uh, hormonal sources that you don't think about. Lastly, um, no matter what the source is, uh, it, this is where the kind of the integrative mindset comes in. And that is that there's something in your microbiome, which is basically the good bacteria in your gut. Uh, people talk about probiotics for just being healthy. Well, one aspect of that is the estrobilome, which is that part of your microbiome, which specifically metabolizes estrogen. Uh, and excretes all the extra estrogen that you have in your body as efficiently as possible. If your microbiome is not functioning well, so you're not paying attention to that part of your health, let's say, as you move into menopause, then potentially all of that excess estrogen from all of those sources can actually feed the endometriosis more. So the point is there's something you can do uh, about modulating that estrogen load that you have, regardless of what the source is, to get rid of the excess. But the picture should be clear that endo, uh, again, partly fed by estrogen, that estrogen factor is not gone after menopause completely. And I forgot to mention that some women, many women actually take estrogen replacement therapy. So that's another source of estrogen. It's a relatively low dose, but the point is that all of these things add up uh, and can cause uh, the endo to grow. In that smaller group that I was mentioning earlier of endo seemingly occurring after menopause where let's just say there was a surgery when somebody's 49 and there's no evidence of endo, but eight years later there's pain and there are issues and then surgery is done and look, there's endo. That's because again, that the estrogen can be produced uh, locally uh, around the, um, uh, the uh, endometriosis cells or these other factors that I'm talking about as well, because in everybody things are a little bit different. So an individual, um, the response to the estrogen, no matter which source it is, may be more than in somebody else. But suffice it to say that there are definitely uh, women who look like they have de novo, brand new, uh, endometriosis being formed well after menopause. The other important thing to, to think about is that in postmenopausal women, um, adenomyosis, which is variably called, say, in, uh, internal endometriosis or growing in the wall of the, the muscle part of the uterus, that 
is all but ignored in postmenopausal women. And in some cases, I've, I've had patients I've operated on deep into their 60s. The MRI shows adenomyosis, but everybody's ignoring that as a possible source of pain. And in fact, it turns out that for all the reasons I just mentioned, with the endometriosis being activated by potentially low doses of estrogen from the various sources, that's what's causing the pain. And so a hysterectomy can be helpful uh, in that situation and maybe actually the main source, uh, maybe the adenomyosis and not so much the uh, endometriosis, but definitely can be a, a lot of issues after menopause uh, that uh, are in fact endometriosis that's persisted and grown or arose uh, after menopause. Right, so it's a, it's a multivariate factor having endometriosis and menopause. People, just, the, bigger, the biggest lesson for me was as long as we, as long as we have estrogen in, in the body and we are gonna have estrogen even in menopause people, that's a risk factor for having endometriosis cells to grow and become symptomatic. But I have one question. Has there been any study in the world, like what percentage of postmenopausal women have endometriosis or like anything in this sense, like what percentage of their pelvic pain is attributed to endometriosis? Or we completely just ignore the fact that these people might have endometriosis, so we never bother to even study them. Unfortunately, in most physicians' eyes, endometriosis doesn't exist after menopause because of the false impression that there's no estrogen. Well, there is estrogen from the various sources uh, we've talked about in the other questions today, uh, and it, it can definitely cause this to, to grow. So to answer that question, I don't know that there's been any studies that accurately, and again, the gold standard would be to operate on these patients to find out if they actually have endo or not as the cause of the pain, but because that's not really done or really considered, we don't know the answer to how many postmenopausal women uh, actually have adeno or endometriosis, right? However, uh, again, of those that do have endometriosis that have been published on over the years, approximately two to 5% are definitely in the postmenopausal years. Again, whether it's something that transitioned from pre to post or actually arose in menopause, but it's still active during menopause. Right, right. Mm, I see. So there is there's a lot of opportunities there for researchers and institutions to dive in and, and find out. Um, I'm trying to follow up on the next on the last question. I kind of know the answer to that, but it's still I, I would like to hear it from you, from, from your expert opinion. That let's say, like, does endometriosis keep progressing after menopause? Like, you know, in teenagers, we say if they have symptoms at 15 and we don't address that, then at 25, we are going to see a patient who has more extensive disease, a lot of adhesions, a lot of fibrosis, probably stage three or four. Are we seeing, like, are, is this reasonable to, to think this is the same thing can happen to menopause people? If we don't address it early, then we are going to deal with something worse later in their life. So after menopause, you're looking at two things. One is the endometriosis uh, growing, um, whether it be brand new or whether a transition from premenopause. But the other is, regardless, even if the menopause was not found and nothing was done, your body is trying to heal, trying to get rid of the endo and trying to heal. How does the body heal? One of the ways is by scarring. Uh, it replaces areas that are damaged with some type of a scar. And we all know that endometriosis, that's a huge aspect uh, of the potentially what causes the pain and certainly what can cause damage to the organs, obstruction of ureters and things like that. So even if the endometriosis is actually not progressing into menopause, the scarring can potentially actually still be progressing and potentially someone, let's just say, they did not have a ultrasound that showed kidney dilatation at 49, but at 53, they did. That could be because the fibrosis is still ongoing 
uh, whether or not the endo is active uh, and causing problems down the line. This doesn't go on forever, but it can definitely cause uh, more symptoms and problems uh, as you move into menopause. So the point is that the longer you let any disease um, fester and not be addressed, the harder it is to address it. Uh, and again, your body's trying to do something as well. It's an incredible healing machine, but unless we help it sometimes, uh, it can't get the job done completely. Meaning, yes, the scarring is normal, but no, it's not good because it can cause problems uh, in someone. So uh, all of those factors contribute to, you know, what does it really cause in menopause? Uh, and sometimes I operate on, on patients who are postmenopausal and we, on microscopy, uh, uh, pathologist actually, can't really find a whole lot of endo, but there's a whole lot of scar. And the patient does a whole lot better after that is, uh, has been removed. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it could be, and this is not unusual uh, in that endo, um, after it does its damage is not necessarily absolutely identified uh, to the pathologist's level of satisfaction. So they will say something like there's hemosiderin-laden macrophages, things in here that suggest endometriosis, but, uh, but it's not absolutely for sure that there's endo there. To me, uh, most of the time, that just means we couldn't find it on the pathology but the reality is it's still there. You can kind of think of it as looking for a needle in a haystack. When the pathologist looks at tissue, they don't look under the microscope at every single millimeter or micron of the tissue that's been sampled. Um, and so we're giving them a haystack and saying, find the needle. Um, sometimes there are a lot of needles and it's easy to find, but sometimes there are not. So, but again, for both reasons, I think that uh, it does cause problems as you move into menopause if you don't do anything about it um, in a timely fashion. Right, so it's great. Uh, and that answer brought, brought up another question that actually some other people have asked us about that. And that this is the perfect time for that question. Uh, and that's about the frozen pelvis. And you mentioned the scars and everything that happens with endometriosis and the body being this amazing healing machine. So what about the frozen pelvis situation? Will symptoms of frozen pelvis change with menopause? So what a frozen pelvis really is, is highly variable uh, in terms of what diagnosis uh, of endometriosis uh, and how that's involved. To some, it is a finding during surgery. To some, it is a pelvic examination finding before surgery. So in other words, you do a pelvic exam and normally where the uterus moves reasonably easily, uh, even if there's some scar, it just literally doesn't move. So it's similar, to, the perception is like there's concrete in there and not normal organs. Um, that's really a true a frozen pelvis where you can detect it that early to where there's a big problem. And then surgically you find that everything's glued together to everything else. So sometimes that's because there's acute endometriosis growing and there is a lot of inflammation and the inflammation itself can cause uh, organs nearby like the rectum and the bladder uh, and the ovaries, let's say there are endometriomas in them, all of that to kind of glue together and almost not move unless it, because they're stuck due to the inflammation to the adjacent organs. So yes, that's a frozen pelvis, but uh, somewhat easier to address than if that frozen pelvis is based on what endo has already caused in terms of fibrosis. Fibrosis is the end result, uh, as we've talked in some of the other questions we're talking about. Um, that is the body's healing, and it's saying, this is as good as it gets. I've got rid of the disease as much as I can, your body talking to you but I had to scar stuff down to do it. That kind of a frozen pelvis is not going to go away no matter what you do, um, including naturopathic approaches of taking enzymes or anything that, that people propose, basically. The fibrosis is pretty much there to stay mostly. I mean, maybe 10% might go away, but 90% of it will stay there because that's the body's end run of fixing things. And so if that fibrosis is severe enough to be 
uh, causing a frozen pelvis, stuff not moving, then you're talking about how do you dissolve concrete? And there is no medication way today or in the reasonably near future to do that. Uh, with active endo, you can talk about anti-inflammatories and things like that that may help. Um, but when you have fibrosis, it, it just, the only way to fix that is by surgically uh, removing it. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. For the next interview, we will discuss the origins of estrogen, the usefulness of aromatase inhibitors in endometriosis, the complications of hormone therapy, the risk of cancer in endometriosis before and after menopause, and also how to communicate with physicians regarding the possibility of endometriosis after menopause. I'll see you soon.